First on four, Encounters takes a trip to the frozen north. Deep inside the Arctic Circle, on the barren coast of northwest Greenland. Even in summer, the sea is thick with icebergs. A vast, unbroken glacier stretches 500 miles inland. Here, a B-29 bomber lies, almost intact, in a shallow glacial lake. The plane, called the Keybird, was on a secret reconnaissance mission in 1947. The pilot lost his bearings, ran out of fuel and crash landed on the snow-covered surface of a frozen lake. The crew were rescued but the keybird would lie here untouched for nearly 50 years. Two years ago Darrell Greenemeyer, a former test pilot, flew up to the B-29 to have a look. I got wind of this B-29, and uh, it really is a unique opportunity because it's in very good condition, it's very complete. It may be the only airplane in the world that I can think of that's been sitting somewhere for 50 years that you could actually get in and potentially fly. I mean, it hasn't been damaged that much, and uh, so it really is an interesting project. It's just in a faraway place. That's, that's the reason it's available. The airplane itself is basically sound. There isn't uh, any problems with it. Uh, we'll put new engines and stuff on it, and it should fly just fine. Four thousand of these bombers rolled off the production lines at the end of World War II. Now, only a handful are left. If it can be rebuilt and flown out of this icy wasteland, the Keybird could fetch millions. Thule Air Force Base is 250 miles south of the B-29 site. From here, Darrell will launch his expedition to bring back the bomber. The annual supply ship docks at Thule, carrying the many tons of equipment Darrell needs. A bulldozer to build a crude runway. New tires and propellers. And four massive reconditioned radial engines at $60,000 apiece. Darrell is gambling half a million dollars, but is it enough to finish the job before the Arctic winter closes in? The first problem is how to carry vital supplies over the miles of desolate, dangerous Arctic landscape that separate Thule from the bomber. Darrell's solution is a 1962 caribou, another of his salvaged wonders. It's an ideal workhorse, but is a 30-year-old airplane any match for the treacherous Arctic terrain? It's basically a short field, you know, short landing and takeoff airplane, and it's made for unimproved fields. They use it in Vietnam a lot. And it's it's pretty rugged airplane. It's ideal for this sort of thing. Flying these engines in, and it will carry a pretty good load. 
Darrell's tight budget has left the caribou without proper de-icing equipment, a big risk in this frozen corner of the world. He's brought together an eight-man team of engineers, mechanics and pilots. Roger is with us because he's an excellent pilot and I've known him for years. And uh, Rick, uh, the, uh, the head mechanic, is just, uh, he, play, he does magic with uh, mechanical things. And uh, Vernon came uh, highly recommended from a good friend of mine in Scottsdale. <laughs> Daryl's anxious to get them to the site and start work. Well, what I'd like to do is get the tractor loaded and get this thing all ready to go and then launch you guys tomorrow. Okay. And then uh, when you get up there we can talk on HF and find out where we're going to land and then we'll bring it on up. Does that okay. sound like yeah. Yeah. that'll work? If we can Let's get the tractor it. in. But the bulldozer is several tons heavier than the caribou is built to carry. Roger von Grote, a retired airline pilot, will fly the caribou. Already he's having doubts about this first flight. Well, I've been with him on a couple projects. Last year I helped him bring an F-7F back from Quantico, Virginia to California. And so about five months ago he asked if I'd like to fly the caribou around. It's a little bit uh, higher risk than I really thought it would be because uh, Daryl uh, maxes everything to the limit. If the, both engines run, it'll get off the ground. But if one engine quits, uh, we're just going to have to crash straight ahead because one engine is not going to carry the load. First, this helicopter will fly north to check out the landing site for the overloaded caribou. It'll also be on standby for any emergencies. But the unpredictable Arctic weather suddenly turns nasty and the caribou can't fly through icy cloud and fog. Weather's definitely going to be the... be the... Determining factor here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's just a lot of things that could happen. I mean, it... there's... a Pandora's box of things that could happen. Which, and we're hoping nothing really bad does happen. Sitting up here and <laughs> imagination runs wild. When the skies eventually clear, the chopper heads out over the glacier. Twenty minutes into the flight, a whining noise from the engine sends them back to Thule. With the helicopter out of action, Darrell must think up another plan, safe enough for the team to go along with. What do you think about going up there in the caribou without the helicopter, just going up and finding a spot to land? Well, I don't know. I've never driven a caribou. But wind is pretty critical, I know that, especially with that load. Is there some way we could drop, drop a flare? And uh, We don't have any flares, do we? See which way the wind's blowing. Or if we go up light, undo the tractor. Go up light and just land, see what it's like, and uh, come back out. Well, Rick's the only other one that's seen the land up there. We ought to get his input. So we're thinking about going up with a, with a caribou and just without the weight on it. And if it looks okay, we'll we'll try it. And see if we can't find a spot to put it down. The tractor is unloaded from the caribou. Thule is a satellite communication station and has no aircraft. Captain Dugan, the base manager, is worried about rescuing people if the caribou crashes. The, the problem that uh, we're running into is in case something happens to the caribou with the helicopter being out of commission now, mm -hmm. is getting somebody up there and back within a 24-hour period because they have enough provisions and they have the, the tents and they're set up uh, that they can last at least 24 to 36 hours if the caribou goes up there and, and breaks on the runway and can't be flown out again. So we've been asking them to fly out along the, the coastline. Uh, the problem with that is going to be if they go down 
we need to know exactly where they are mm -hmm. and uh, to get rescue forces up there because it would be a nightmare to try to comb this whole coast. Despite all the doubts, the caribou takes off. over icy seas and uncharted glaciers. Finally, they reach the valley where the B-29 has sat for nearly half a century. Roger makes a trial touchdown to test the ground. It seems firm, so they go round again for a landing. Keybird gleams like new in the chill Arctic sun. Built in 1945, it never saw combat and had hardly been flown when it belly flopped onto the frozen lake. The inside is just as the crew left it. I honestly didn't think we was going to get out of it. I, I, I had made up my mind on the way down that uh, this is no dream. This is reality. Face it and uh, accept it. You know, we realized once we're out, the, the plane was not on fire. That was the main uh, concern. Arnett made a hell of a good landing, and uh, the, the airplane was intact. Once one of thousands, today the Keybird is a unique survivor. This is the only airplane that. that that I don't know of, it's been up over the North Pole made a crash landing, a control crash landing, that if they can bring it back, it's got to be something unique. It's got to have a, a value to it, one of a kind. I've got torn feelings. And everybody's excited about getting it out and they're going to make a lot of money on it apparently uh, and everybody's going to look at this airplane, it's great and all that. But somehow it's something like uh, going into an Indian grave as far as I'm concerned. I kind of feel like it belongs up there. Daryl 
ever the optimist, reckons it'll take about three weeks to get the bomber into the air. So they'll need tents and cooking gear to survive the volatile weather. Thule, Thule, this is Keybird, Keybird, over. Rick tries to radio Thule to tell the Air Force they landed safely. If they don't want to talk to me. But as the caribou starts the return trip to pick up the bulldozer, disaster strikes. Daryl was trying to taxi around, I was out watching, and then he got going a little bit, and then nose wheel just went all the way 90. Both tires rolled off, you know, rolled off the rim, lost all their air. I thought we were stuck there. It takes hours to dig out the wheels and the only way to inflate the tires is with highly inflammable propane gas from the camp stove. If the wheels get too hot on landing, they could explode. Oh, oh Rick, yeah. Oh, yeah, we fill us with propane. <laughs> Ingenuity. Yeah. He said, don't roll them too fast or they might blow. The caribou heads off for Thule to pick up the bulldozer. The plane is the only lifeline for Rick and the others left behind. Back at Thule, the propane is let out of the tires. Don't make any sparks. <laughs> Don't make any sparks. The bulldozer once again is loaded up. Dangerously overburdened caribou lumbers off on the flight Roger has been dreading. Back at the B-29, Rick lights a fire to show wind direction and mark the safety limit of the runway. As the caribou comes in, palms moisten and hearts beat faster. Can Roger bring it down in one piece? Ninety knots. I, I was stalling. I was in this shaker at ninety, and uh, Daryl said we can't do it with Holly flaps. I thought, oh shit, I don't want to go all the way back there. We're getting low on fuel. The wing flaps had failed, and Roger almost lost control as the caribou plowed into the soft earth. Another inch deeper, and the propellers would have smashed into the ground, ending the expedition before it had begun. But Darrell had beaten the odds and can't resist taking the bulldozer for a spin round the camp. Darrell and his new toy. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tear it up our new runway. Yeah, look at him. The girls have fun out there. The project is now two weeks old and the real work is only just beginning. Step one is to pull the B-29 out of the water. sunk into the mud and won't budge easily. Again, the thinking caps go on. 
but if we had two pulleys, we'd go right. back to the... Well, we've got two pulleys. Will that little one fit on this cable at all? Have we got a smaller cable? Well, let's try that. A makeshift pulley system does the trick. Keybird is back on dry land. B-29 crashed in 1947, the bomb bay doors were badly mauled. They'll be taken off completely for the flight to Thule. Well, the snow really cushioned it real well. It, it built up under the bomb bays and the bomb bay doors took all the load and about 90% of the damage. There's a little bit of damage on the aft fuselage but that, and on the flaps, but that's it. But there's a more basic worry. Is the airframe safe to fly? Well, in my business, you, you learn to see corrosion, and the worst kind is intergranular corrosion. There's not even any surface corrosion on the airplane, or, or very minimal, and not in any structural area. So um, I have no fear at all that the, uh, the structural integrity of the airplane is intact. The key elements were the engines, but uh, we've got four new engines. We ran two of them on the test stand. They all ran, they ran great. We need to uh, get these engines on and tidied up and ready to run and then hang propellers. The tires, they look good, but they're uh, rayon, and uh, rayon doesn't age well, so we brought up some nylon tires to change them out. The uh, rudder and the elevators are going to be uh, changed out. Coming on over here to the, uh, the ailerons, the control surfaces were fabric, and they, uh, they have to be changed. They were paper thin. You could put your wow. finger right through them. So that, that pretty well covers the, uh, you know, the major items. So there's a lot of work to do inside, like uh, uh, cleaning up the cockpit, and uh, there's some instruments that are missing and damaged, and uh, that's pretty much it. The caribou plays a crucial part in the project, flying in new engines, propeller blades and other essential parts from Thule. The propellers were badly buckled by the impact of the crash. The engine bearings were completely shot. themselves are massive 18-cylinder radials, the most powerful ever built. Fitting the huge engines is a tough job even in a well-equipped hangar. Doing it okay. in the middle of the Arctic will be a back-breaking task. Well, how do you want to dismantle this thing? Well, first we've got to take the carburetor, take all this stuff off, then we've got to take the injection pumps off, then we've got to take the carburetor off. Okay. Then we take the motor mount off. All right. To help pay for the project, the old engines will be overhauled and sold off. It goes off, 
the caribou can only carry one engine at a time. They have to be fitted into the original casing and lifted up. Rick designed the hoist using old photographs. thousands of new parts. The old ones have to be cleaned up and put back to work. I was a little disappointed when I saw some of the stuff laying around on the ground that had blown out of the plane because it was rusty. But then once I climbed up in the plane and started looking at the components that were actually bolted into the plane that really need to be there to, 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 to run, I, <laughs> I can't believe it. All these little gearboxes, the grease that they packed them with kind of got hard from sitting here for so long. But once I wash that out and put new grease back in them, they're, they're perfect. It's great. <laughs> it's brand new. It's absolutely unique in, in its location and in its condition. I think the worst part of it is the fact that we're going to have a fairly short strip to take off out of. So that means that uh, the engines are going to have to really be running good. But they should. But the B-29 isn't the only plane with problems. On the next shuttle trip to Thule, Roger has to turn back after the caribou loses an engine. It's only a blown fuse, but the trip is a washout. We were going to take a, an engine back and some accessories and then uh, load up the grader and uh, what else are we going to... Oh, the flight controls and some fuel, start hauling fuel in and uh, because we need to start on the runway. So it's, uh, it's really disappointing. What can I say? I mean, it's... Uh, here we got two beautiful days of weather coming up and uh, we got plenty of work to do, but it's, it's just going to... You know, if, if we can't take off on Monday, then we are behind. We're going to have people sitting on their hands doing nothing. You didn't sign on for this kind of stuff, did no. you, Roger? <laughs> I suppose you shuttled back and forth. <laughs> well, that's what we're doing, basically, but it's, yeah. it's really tough. <laughs> now, I suspect it was gauges, too, but you don't know it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guarantee you it's a gauge, but you don't know it. Yeah. Now the weather is causing delays. Low clouds have grounded the caribou. And, ominously, snow is beginning to settle on surrounding hills. The freezing wind chills the bone, making the 15-hour days seem like a week. Generators and starter motors have to be fitted to the engines. The exhaust cowling has to be hammered on. Precious hours slip away. Uh, have you heard a report from the Casa on the tops of the clouds? And also, is it uh, scattered or broken back uh, two weeks? It's now August, and the project is two weeks behind. Darrell is desperate to keep the shuttle flights going and takes bigger risks with the weather. Okay, I guess we'll uh, we'll give it a shot. We'll come around and then uh, we'll try and come in under it.
wouldn't have dampened the spirits. Hey, bud. Go down. Rick, in particular, is showing the strain of the grinding workload. Give me a screwdriver. A small one, Cecilia. Mealtimes bring some respite from the biting cold. It's also a chance to relive old exploits. I want Daryl to tell us a story about his last takeoff accident. See if it was anything similar to this, you know. Tell us about that 123, Daryl. They wanted me to take off on the ramp so they didn't have to open up the fence to get on Panama property to use the runway. So I said, well, no problem. But then they wanted me to take off uh, a little bit downwind because if I went the other way, I'd be flying over the general's house. Okay. And, and so okay. I said, well, okay, I think so. Uh, it was a downhill run and then a slight turn, about 60 knots, and then down the ramp. <laughs> <laughs> How much runway do you have all told? I don't remember, but what happened was I went down the little hill and made the right turn, and then it started bouncing. And all of a sudden, the, uh, the nose wheel steering kicked out, and uh, I tried to hold it, and, it, and the, I was too close to the fence. And so it, it kind of lifted off and then squatted right down on the fence. <laughs> but I didn't give up just then. I kept going. <laughs> the painstaking work goes on. Repairing the control surfaces takes as much time as the engines. The rudder is recovered with fabric. The tiny parts for the flight controls have to be handmade. There are no blueprints Often it's just trial and error. And then put the other one with a flange in its place and then stick, drill this one out and stick it in the other end. So we'll have the same configuration Just again. like we made the other two. Well, you just, uh, yeah, except that, no, no, we'll go to this, this size bowl. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So we're going up. Okay. Right. By the time the rudder is ready, the project has taken five weeks far longer than Darrell's original forecast. Why don't you give me that, uh... The bolt? Is that the correct one up there? Yep. Even simple jobs are taking ages. Alright. Beautiful. Stick a bolt in there and I'll wiggle it around. Can you tap it in? Well, you see the flange in front? It's got to be straight with this. I mean in back. In back, in the back of the flange. See, it's a flat spot? Yeah, I see the flat spot. Well, it isn't lined up. Well, it isn't. It's yeah. going. Oh, are you crying? Are you so happy with those tears of joy? <laughs> you got it. But the long hours are beginning to pay off. The B-29 now looks very different from when they started in July. The propellers uh, came out of the prop shop in Tucson and they've been overhauled but they mm -hmm. haven't been final assembled yet. We'll put those together and hang them on. But I don't anticipate any problem with that. They, I've done that before and they, they usually go together pretty easy. These are awful big propellers, so the biggest I've ever dealt with. Okay, come on. Carefully balanced in a workshop, they have to be reassembled in the right sequence, or they'll rip the engines apart. Oh, burning! <laughs> 
step right on your foot. Great care is needed to stop dirt getting into the hub. Well, okay. It needs to be wiped off. It's probably got sand all over it now. Put it down. Here. Put it down. Okay, it's down. Here, let me have it. Up. Oh, okay. You got it. All right. Here we go. Let's go. Hup. Let's go. Okay, set it down. feet across and weighing almost a ton, they're Push. difficult to maneuver. <laughs> oh, okay, that looks good. Boo, hoo, hoo. We're going to have to come okay. down about an inch and a half first. How's the crane for it? Okay. A little bit more. Okay, hold it. Okay, that's it. Okay, now you should be able to rock it. Now it's time to start an engine. It's the first real test after weeks of exhausting work and the engine refuses to start. Oh, we got a couple of those now. Rick thinks he knows what's wrong. Did you give me a pair of 10 snips? work repairing the B-29 will all be wasted if it can't take off. The runway has to be flat enough and long enough to get the 45-ton bomber airborne. Darrell uses the bulldozer and grader to level the ground and dry out the soil, but heavy rain has left it waterlogged. The strip is marked with flags for over 5,000 feet, but Darrell hopes he can take off in 2,000 few pilots would be willing to take the risk. This is the worst spot of all, right yeah. here, and uh, it's, 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 it's really at a critical distance. Well, you know, like you were saying two days ago, there was no water here, so hopefully with, you know, three or four good days, yeah. just like this, this water won't even be here. Uh, this yellow marker down here, you say that's the... 2,000 uh, feet. 2,000. Yeah. And this white marker just behind us here is uh, 1,500 feet, yeah. and your, your nose will be very, very light at 1,500 feet, I'd guess. Yeah. You know, with any kind of luck, you should be uh, airborne by about 1,800, wouldn't you think? I would think so. Yeah. I'm just concerned about the alignment here. Uh, we got that one bog mm -hmm. that we just walked about 800 through. 800 feet. Right. And if we can get through that uh, and get this dried up a little and covered over... Uh, you'll have a fighting can... chance at it, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. August the 22nd, and the first sunset signals the approach of the polar winter. The project is now seven weeks old, and only one engine's been tested. Time is running out fast. We've got to uh, 
hook everything up to them to make sure that they work. Uh, Going to put the magnetos on, the generators, all the fuel system, the oil system. It probably takes uh, 12, 14 hours after the time you stick it on there per motor uh, to actually get them going. Uh, and, th and that's in a nice heated hangar with all the tools that you need. But so uh, when it's blowing, uh, blowing snow sideways, it takes a little bit longer and we'll fix it. We'll get it going. A few days later and all four engines are ready to go. <coughs> will have to run perfectly to lift the giant bomber from such a short runway. Rick is worried the keybird might not make it. Why don't you stand off on that side and look down there and see if you can see the oil leaks. I'm going to go around here and see if I can find anything. Rick is extremely tired. He's taking painkillers for what he thinks is back strain. But the pills don't always work. Most days he's faced the grueling schedule in great pain. Rick's condition is also a major practical headache for Daryl. He'll need Rick as flight engineer to stand any chance of making it to Thule, because all the engine controls are at the back of the cockpit, behind the pilot. But Daryl presses on. Next day, the caribou leaves to bring back fuel for the bomber. It returns with a serious mechanical problem, the worst so far. We lost partial power on the uh, right engine of the Caribou, and uh, we thought it was probably a cylinder problem, and uh, when we arrived, uh, we found that we had a, uh, a stuck exhaust valve, and it was hitting the top of the piston, and uh, we need a cylinder to get out of here uh, with any kind of safety at all. Then the weather finally breaks, bringing gale force winds and freezing rain. The temperature plummets. Soon, life here will be impossible. The only hope of escape is to get the caribou flying again. Roger radios Thule to send a spare cylinder. The only plane around is a tiny single-engine Cessna from the Thule Flying Club. Flying almost blind through low cloud, the Cessna suddenly pops into view. 
but will it overshoot the makeshift runway? The Cessna pilot is keen to get away before the bad weather returns. It does the next day. If they don't get out now, they never will. The first winter snow is settling on the camp. For Daryl, time has beaten him. Work on the keybird has stopped as everyone who can struggles to fix the caribou. Rick desperately needs a doctor. Too ill to work, he's left the repairs to Vernon and Cecilio, who've never done it before. But despite inadequate tools and frozen fingers, they manage to change the cylinder. still has a serious oil leak. There's no guarantee it won't pack up altogether as they fly over the glacier. Is there any way to put oil in it while we're going? There is, but it's not hooked up. Can we hook it up? I don't know, we could ask Rick. Every flight of the caribou was a flirtation with death. This would be no exception. You fly this now? Yeah. If we could put uh, oil in the engine, while we're flying, then we have absolutely no problem at all. Daryl's dream and the money he sunk into the project will all be left behind. As ice is swept off the caribou, Daryl admits he's run out of ideas. I'm just going to have to sit down and, and take a long thinking session about what we're going to do. I haven't given up. We've got too much. Uh, we're too close. The airplane is essentially ready to fly. And I, I'm just going to have to sit down and think about it. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, we never did get a runway suitable to take off this year. The uh, uh, winter caught us. Rick is sicker than a dog. We've got to get him out of here and probably to a hospital. And so things are coming to a screeching halt. Made lots of mistakes. <laughs> lots of mistakes. A uh, uh, mistake in uh, estimating the, what we needed back here. Uh, and the equipment, I thought we could get by with some old equipment. But even, even the new equipment gave us trouble. I mean, this is the, just harsh uh, environment. At last they're ready to pull out, leaving the keybird where it's been for nearly 50 years. Halfway through the flight, the caribou's right engine blows up, but Roger manages to limp into Thule. Rick, barely conscious, is carried off. Next day, he's flown to hospital in Canada. Tragically, two weeks later, following an operation for serious blood clots, he dies. And the bomber he'd planned to fly over the Humboldt Glacier
stayed where it had been for nearly fifty years.